I'm old enough to know that climate change is happening just from my experience watching the seasons here in the north of England. I'm also sensible enough to know that it's us, global citizens, who are at fault, either through causing it or doing nothing about it. My guest today is a great example of a conscious citizen. She's certainly doing something about it and has some great thinking for business leaders who also want to play their part. But a warning, I may appear to be rude in the following introduction of her, but bear with me and I trust you will then excuse me. You see, my guest is a self-confessed eco-nut. Welcome, Joan Gregerson. <laughs> Welcome, Malcolm. So nice to talk with you. <laughs> You're in Denver, Colorado, and uh, I suppose it's warm here, and it's a wet northeast of England that we're that we're um, subject to it at the moment. Okay, let's get on with our questions, Joan. Joan, I've probably offended some viewers by calling you an eco nut, but that's your term, isn't it? What is, it is. It, what is it that you do that earns you that title? Tell us your <laughs> range of activity. <laughs> uh, well. I guess yes. Yeah, somebody th might think that an eco nut is a is a not respectful title, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but I guess the the way that I came up with it is that uh, I was actually going through career coaching in my fifties, which was I would say embarrassing as I, when I first got in there that I thought, oh my gosh, I'm in my fifties, I have no idea what I should be doing. And I, I felt like all these other things I had been trying, like teaching and traveling abroad and um, doing engineering, I felt like they were all disconnected. But when I went through this career coaching, it always came back to connecting to nature and to caring about the planet. And, and that's when I had this realization, Joan, you're an eco nut. And then it made sense because then it, I realized everything that I do, as long as it's helping the planet, there's a lot of different ways I could go about it. And it was actually a big relief when I figured that out. All right. Excellent. Here at the Conscious Business Academy, one of our pillars for our new society, we believe, is active environmentalism, meaning we don't think it should be just a tick box compliance activity within a business, but an embedded strategy to care for our planet. I know businesses have a lot more to manage at the moment with pandemic, etc. But how can they be active within their people to encourage climate care policy? Yes, that's a great question. And, you know, I, I can say that I, I just turned 60. And there's no way in heck that I ever would have imagined that I would get to age 60 and that somehow taking care of the environment would still not be a top priority. And so I've, I've been through enough to see that there's always an excuse of why we don't have time, why we can't do it now. And, and the thing is, you know, it's hard it's, it's hard to, to articulate and to appreciate. It's, it's kind of like if you're standing on a chair and you're saying, well, I don't care if the chair falls, I'm too busy changing the light bulb. It's like, no, you've got, we have to take care of our foundation. Nothing else matters. We can't solve, um, we can't solve race relations. We can't solve anything with the economy. If we if, I mean, we're 70% water. If we don't have clean water, if we don't have clean air, if we don't have soil that is regenerating, then nothing else matters. And so finding a way to, to understand that it's job number one is, it's a challenge, but I think that once people get it, it becomes very exciting. And and this idea of using teams is one way to, to take it off the plate of the people at the top and really rely on everyone to, to encourage their, their ideas and give them a way to, to bring this creative force forward. Mm. I, I 
I'm totally with you. I'm fortunate, or we're fortunate, that we live in a county called Northumberland in northeast England, which is just castles and sheep. So we un and the Hadrian's Wall's close by. So we understand the environment. But those in clogged into cities, it must be hard sometimes. But many companies are starting to adopt the triple bottom line thinking of planet, people, and profits. But in my mind, these are often initiatives that don't have a total commitment from the top. So how can CEOs and boards awaken to the need for climate leadership? After all, they seem to be pulled in differing directions by doubting politicians. How can they make a stand? What would convince them, do you think? Well, I think one of the things, I mean, it, it's it's a great question. And as you said, the, this disconnection from nature, you know, if you're living amongst sheep and um, prairies or pasture and you, you, you're you seeing all that, but like for me right now, I'm living in a city in a studio apartment and it's very easy for people to get disconnected from nature. And so it is a big challenge for CEOs, for business people um, but one thing that I would say is that when what I like to do is really think about how how can we be effective protecting the planet? And it starts by understanding that we haven't been in the past. You know, if the environmental movement was a pizza delivery service, the pizza would never come. Yeah. We'd just be like, well, we, you know, we tried, we tried to deliver the pizza. Sorry. I mean, but like we haven't been protecting the environment that one of the uh, reports from the International uh, Biodiversity Group from the UN says we're running towards the edge of a cliff. I mean, this I think this is first and foremost that people have to understand we can't go on doing things this, the way they were before. Um, and so one of the reasons that the environmental movement and companies have not been effective is because it has been a top-down approach and cities and states where they set these goals. But what they don't do is they don't go with trust to the people in the communities and say, what is it that you see that you would like to work on and how can we help you a little bit? And this is what I've figured out is that in my engineering, we were going in and like, quote unquote, fixing things, which didn't have any buy in from people. And it didn't, it ended up not having this kind of savings. But as I started working with teams and communities that and so your your employees, your your people in the communities you're serving, they already have ideas of what could be done. And if you can help empower them, this idea I talk about mentor and mobilize. So you don't have to think of everything. You, you don't have to figure it all out. You just need to be open and, and mentoring and mobilizing those folks and giving them a structure. And that's what, the, that's what I'm doing with this climate action challenge structure. Excellent. Yes. And I, I'm totally with you. You know, the work I've done in communities around the UK in the past, you go into a, a tough community and they know what will work. You know, they will know that they need a, a children's play area or they know that they need a garden centre and so on. Yeah. Uh, Joan, tell us about your book and it's a company and workbook. What sparked you to write it and what do you hope to achieve with it? Well, I think... Um... A lot of us who write a book are writing it for the younger person. <laughs> I'm writing it for the younger me. You know, I, I wrote my first poem. Uh, uh, it was published when I was 10 years old and it was out about air pollution. So I guess I should have known then. But, you know, I've always been passionate about the environment. I thought everybody was. Um, and I, I really spent decades being very ineffective, as has our entire humanity has also been. And so when I started doing these teams, I say I accidentally started an environmental nonprofit in the city of Longmont. We changed the course of the city in two years. Previously, I'd lived 17 years in a small town and I was able to get a recycling center in, but nothing else. And then after I did that one team in Longmont, I came back to my hometown, started a team there, and it took off. And I was like, 
oh my gosh, teams, they're magic. The number one climate action is start a team. And nobody was talking about this. You know, when people talk about what you should do for climate action, you go to any website and it'll say, you know, eat more plants, Mm. ride your bike. But I think it should say start a team, you know, figure out what you can do in your community and work on it together because together you're going to have the personal resilience to endure. You're going to help each other figure it out. And you're going to have the kind of power you can then go to your city council and say, hey, we're this group and we want, we're working. We, you work for us. We want this thing to happen. Um, And so I knew that as I started on this and got this idea, I wanted to share it, but I knew that I needed more stories to tell people. So I, I started a podcast. I've done this thing called the Earth Week Summit, where I interview 20 people each year. And so now I have all these stories of people that have gotten together, made something happen as part of a team, and I've collected all their tidbits of best practices. And so that's what the book Climate Action Challenge is all about, is all these best practices. And it's the book that I'm handing to my younger self. Here you go, Joan. This is what you want. (laughs) Joan Jr. (laughs) Yes, exactly. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> brilliant. I, re- I really like Brilliant. I like that. Let's move away, though, from climate to another subject that's on our consciousness agenda, and that is wellness, where you are an experienced coach. I want to talk about mental health. The challenge I see is that the traditional boss has got no experience in this area, but knows he or she needs to act to protect their teams and people, especially those working from home. My fear is that they may take the the wrong advice and the wrong approach out of sheer panic into wanting to do something fast. How do you suggest a conscious leader approaches this important yet sensitive subject in a correct and a sustainable manner? Uh, Should the company, for example, have an internal wellness ambassador? Yes, that is, I mean, when we're talking about the foundations of of everything that you can do, it also rests on on your mental health, on your your kind of overall wellness. Um, and yeah, I was trained as a wellness coach, and um, and a lot of what I learned being a wellness coach is how I apply to the environmental work. I I use kind of the addiction recovery model for how we do our environmental work as well. That's coaching, that kind of coaching model. And so that works anywhere. And I think what we, what we know doesn't work is that top-down approach. Okay, everybody do this. It's like that never works. And so using that same approach, uh, one place that I worked, we started something called Wellness Wednesdays. Oh. And It was so simple and it was so lovely and it was based on a lot of what I knew as a wellness coach, but it was a totally voluntary thing. And it was a group of us that ate our lunch together on Wednesdays. And if you're, um, you know, you're disconnected now in different spots because of, uh, of COVID social distancing, this would probably be even better to get together in an informal way with your your coworkers. And, and so the whole idea of wellness coaching, uh, using some of the techniques called motivational interviewing, um, that, that motivational interviewing is a technique that came out again of addiction recovery. And it's helping people change on their own terms, um, in a nutshell. And it's learning how to talk about things that in a way that help and in and and avoiding the ways that don't. Um, Like when I was working on the tobacco quit line, we were taught about this idea is somebody might want to quit. They might be, it might be their first time ever calling. If you say something wrong, you, they may never call back again. It might be kind of a death sentence for them. So I always think of that as rebel, repel and rebel. Um, And so, you can set something up that is very simple, that it's, what do you want to work on this week? What, how did it go last week? And do you need any ideas for what you want to do? And also, you know, share what's working. And that simple model 
is a very respectful thing. Because as you said, Malcolm, if you come down with, well, you need to get this much exercise or we're going to push this thing, you know, a lot of those things don't even work anymore. Like a gym membership, like I, a lot of countries, you know, are, should you be going to a gym? It's very difficult to know. So trusting that the person there can identify, you know, what is the stickiest point in my week right now? What is something that I could do to work on it? And having that kind of support system. So something very simple like that is where I would start. But it's always trusting trusting the people know themselves best and giving them a little bit of structure uh, and support around that. Brilliant. I, by the way, Joan, I'm going to steal that idea, Wellness Wednesdays, but I'm going to expand it to wow, wellness on Wednesdays. And it's Wednesday. Why not? It's Wednesday. Yes. Yeah. Well, it beats <laughs> oh, my, I love that. <laughs> it beats my previous one, a wicked on Wednesday, but I might. <laughs> Joan, you've achieved and are achieving a lot in your eco nut climate action challenge campaign. What are you especially proud about amongst all of that? Oh, and what gets you up in the morning raring to go? Well, uh, that's a good wow question. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, you know, when I, when I was writing this book, I was trying to figure out how do I get people to actually do it? Because mm. I've written other books that have gotten five-star reviews by a handful of people, but not didn't really get out there. And so that's probably one of the worst things to do is write a great book that nobody reads. So yeah. I was like, all right, this climate action challenge. So the, the subtitle is a proven plan for launching your eco initiative in 90 days. So I said, all right, let's have a challenge. Let's see if people can follow this process, this procedure, and actually launch their initiatives in 90 days. So I put the call out there. And so now we're right in the middle of it. It is going September, October, and November. We're having our impact summit in uh, December 15th through 17th. But what gets me up is I keep getting these messages. I Somebody in Kenya just planted a tree on my behalf. He planted uh -huh. 6,000 trees last week. And one of them had uh, my a, a little sign that he, he hand wrote that was in my honor. We have uh, a couple girls in the Philippines who are starting community gardens for 25 families that were recently displaced. Uh, we've got some young people in Colombia, Ecuador, um, Bolivia, Mexico that are working together on a new blog to feature climate action stories of their peers. And so hearing, hearing what people are doing and, and how we're doing it together. So Thursdays, we have, we meet on zoom, two different time zones. Um, and people from around the world just talk about what they're doing. Some are doing voter outreach. Another's a marine biologist doing a podcast on sargassum algae with her international cohorts. It's just incredible. A guy, the, the two people in Uganda, they work in the slums of Kampala to teach people vertical gardening. Um, just amazing stuff. And so this is what the, the beauty and the the welcoming of when you are in alignment with mother nature, it reaps so many rewards. And this is what we're seeing. People with very little resources have learned to how to grow tree seedlings and how to plant them. They're in direct relationship with nature. Nature's so abundant and we forget about this, this simple relationship. So I think as people get in relationship with mother earth, it's just, and with each other, it's, it's a really beautiful thing, especially during these really tumultuous times to have this positive vibe all around. I've only one thing to say to that. Wow. <laughs> That's and the only well, thing that I'm, you could I'm, say. <laughs> and whilst you're just having a little chortle there, I just want to point out to my viewers and remind them of your, to take down your URL. It's on the screen behind me where you'll find all the information and links to all the other activities that Joan's about. Uh, by the way, I know Econut, I understand that, but I think you should change your titling to Eco Warrior or Eco Champion, uh, not just to enhance credibility and reach out, but get those businesses who need to be authentic 
authentic in their green credentials. They do need to be authentic, don't they? Yes, they do. And I, I do think that the, the terminology is, is an interesting thing that um, I think a lot of the indigenous cultures have much better language around this. You know, they talk about trees as, as persons. And I was thinking about that the other day when I was up going up into the forest, like what a beautiful that world that is if all the trees are these ancient people that are, mm. are with us. And, and I think the, so warrior, I, I, I like the kind of protecting, but I also don't like fighting. Yeah. And so I'm, I'm kind of, I, it's hard to find a, a, a word, but the eco nut, what that is, is kind of the, you know, the mystics that were just so in love with the divine Mm. they're just head over heels that's that's what i see that the people that start having this relationship they just they're head over heels in love with birds and rivers and it's it's beyond any kind of you know rational anything that 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 fuels them mm, i understand yes we just got to get CEOs and that to understand that uh, the impact that their business may be making on the on the environment. Joan, final question, and it's Walt Disney time or something like that, because I like to give my guests three wishes. You know, if I were to give you three wishes for the understanding by business leaders of the benefits of them embedding climate consciousness in their business, what would those three wishes be? The three wishes, I would say that the, the first wish would be that they, they would open up the conversation with their, their staff, with their employees, and with their customers and their suppliers, and just start talking. And this is kind of like the get real, the Dr. Phil yeah. <laughs> conversation. <Yeah. laughs> Like, let's just don't ignore it. Let's actually start talking about it. What are we concerned about for our kids? What have we seen throughout our lifetime that's changed? So let's get real. And that, that, that idea of what have you seen change through your lifetime is a really good lens to use um, because it's not, you know, you don't have to rely on anything contentious. It's here's what I've seen. Yeah. Um, and the second thing I would say is, is the idea of teams. So if you have some people that are, you know, you have these people in your organization with your clients, with your suppliers. If you have people that are really excited about alternative transportation ideas, then get them together and let them start talking about it and let them encourage them to bring these ideas forward. You know, you've got somebody else that's really interested in, in more natural foods and organic foods and how, you know, the less processed foods and not using palm oil and how that, you know, they, they know all those details. Get those people together and let them, encourage them to, to make those changes themselves and bring it forward. So this idea that you don't have to do it yourself but you just have to encourage these ideas uh, to come forward. I worked one place where uh, I was very near the cafeteria and all day long people would stand there in front of the recycling and go, is this recyclable? Should we yeah. throw this in here? <laughs> and finally my other colleague and I we were like, this is not that hard. Let's fix this. And so we, but we had to push and push to become a team, to get the recycling company in, to come and, do the education, but we didn't know who to talk to. It was, you know, it was rough. You can see why most people just said, oh, forget, I'll put my earphones in and ignore it. Um, and then the third is, I think, just bringing the fun and bringing families together and having more of these. One of the things I talk about in the book is how an Earth Day festival is something that can, is one of the things that turns things around in cities and in communities. And as an engineer, I was like, birthday festivals, walking in Halloween parades, pushing compost carts, how could that work? But that stuff works. Mm. And so 
you know, encouraging that kind of fun, the, the creativity, I guess that's the last thing is understanding that it's a way to spark creativity and collaboration that will spill over into every other aspect of the business. Mm. Joan, I think those are lovely, the three wishes there. You keep putting back, keep putting back. Joan Gregerson, thank you for a wonderful interview. Keep doing what you're doing because you're doing great. Thank you so much, Malcolm. It's been a pleasure to be here talking with you and being part of this whole conscious business movement. 